Welcome to Behind the Line, where we pull back the curtain on the challenges facing first responders and frontline workers. The work you do is unique, and so are the stresses that go with it. Join me as we tackle key issues to reduce risks for burnout, and as we work to support you in doing the job you love without sacrificing being the kind of person you want to be. Hey, and welcome back to Behind the Line. I'm your host, Lindsay Foss. If you're new to Behind the Line, what you should know about me is that I'm a clinical counselor specializing in trauma therapy. And after over a decade working with first responders and frontline workers around issues like burnout, compassion fatigue, PTSD, and related OSIs, I've become a passionate wellness advocate and educator for those who sacrifice so much for our communities out on the front lines. Behind the Line is a place for us to talk about the real-life behind-the-scenes challenges facing you on the front lines. I created this podcast with the hope of bringing easy access to skills for wellness, allowing you to find greater sustainability both on the job and off. For those who have been following closely, you'll know that today we are wrapping up our series on frontline families, a topic I am positive we will return to again down the road and that this is the last episode before we go into summer holidays. While I'm taking the summer off from putting out new episodes, I hope those of you who are newer to the podcast will go back and check out some of the earlier episodes that are sure to have some value for you. I will also be doing some weekly email newsletters throughout the summer months with some helpful resources to support wellness. If you would like me to show up in your inbox through the summer months, be sure to sign up for our mailing list. You can do that on our podcast website, Google Behind the Line Lindsay to find it. Today is a bit of a shift from what I had initially planned to talk about. Initially, my intention had been to talk about frontline families over time and the need to adapt as kids age, as we grieve the loss of family members, as we perhaps face different struggles in our marriages or other relationships, or with our own mental health. This is a topic we'll circle back to, I'm sure, because I think it has a ton of value. Meanwhile, I received some feedback after the episode on parenting that released a few weeks ago, and it was really striking for me. The feedback centered around the fact that while the episode offered some good content pertaining to the classic family system, that it failed to address the unique needs and challenges of those balancing frontline work with single parenting. And it's true. The challenges for single parents are absolutely unique and underrepresented, particularly given the normalcy of divorce these days and the disproportionate rate of divorce for those who work on the front lines. I want you all to know that I take your feedback very seriously, and I appreciated being called out for not doing better at giving voice to what is a common problem for many of you listening. To those who shared this feedback, I want to thank you for having the courage to call me on it and acknowledge my appreciation to be invited to tackle the topic. I am not a single parent, and although I have many people in my life who are, this is not a topic I'm willing to tackle on my own. Thankfully, Mariah LaBelle has agreed to join me today and share about her own experience as a divorced single parent to two young girls while also balancing life in the fire department. I met Mariah during our first run of the self-care dare five-day challenge for first responders and frontline workers. She had shared in the private Facebook group about some of her challenges navigating self-care when juggling so many demands. When I heard the feedback and the need to address the topic of frontline work and single parenting, Mariah immediately sprung to my mind, and I'm grateful she agreed to come on and share her story offer her thoughts, and suggest some strategies that she's found helpful in walking this precarious balancing act. I hope that those who felt unrepresented in the episode on parenting feel seen, heard, known, and valued today, because your experience matters and it counts for a lot. Welcome, Mariah. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm really glad you agreed to take the time to join us and that we were able to figure out the three-hour time difference between us to find a time to connect, (laughs) like its own version of a challenge. Uh, I'd love for us to start, if you would be open to just kind of telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey into single parenthood as a frontline worker. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm 37. I got two girls. They're seven and five. They're going to be eight and six next month. Um, I started my frontline work 10 year or 14 years ago now um, at ambulance dispatching. So okay. that was in um, here in Ontario. And then I uh, needed to change. Um, switched into the fire service from there. Um, yeah. I'm in a smaller fire department, so it's definitely a lot less call volume and call types for sure. Okay. Um, and then about two and a half years ago, my wife left. Um, mm -hmm. And about a year and a half ago, I've been in my own place. Um, wow. Yeah. So it's been uh, it's been a challenging couple of years for sure. Um, I imagine a lot of transition. Yeah. Yeah. Got a PTSD diagnosis in the middle of that too. And just kind of mm. hit what I would like to call my rock bottom. But I'm on the other yeah. side now, thankfully. So it took yeah. a while, but yeah, definitely has been a lot. Um, so our custody schedule is basically I have my kids when I'm not working and okay. my ex has them when I am at work. Okay. I and work. you're on like a flex shift rotation. Yeah. It was six week um, rotational schedule, 10 hour days and 14 hour nights right now. We're going to okay. be switching to 24 hours eventually, but yeah, that's, uh, hopefully soon. But yeah. So I basically am at work and I have my kids. Yeah. Okay. I mean, to some extent, it sounds like that offers a little bit of its own balance. Right. It does, yeah. Um, I have them sometimes a little extra, like I'll get them earlier than than normal. Um, my ex is often asking for extra nights or whatever. So okay. um, so I get a lot of that as well, which has been good and bad. Yeah. I mean, there's like this really interesting facet of single parenthood that involves navigating all of these extra pieces, right? So right. And, and I, I imagine that that depends and probably lives on like a spectrum of some kind, depending on the nature of the relationship at the time of divorce, right? Like, mm -hmm. are we able to remain amicable? Mm -hmm. Did this happen in the context of like domestic violence and abuse and things that make right. custody arrangements and things like that far more complicated and convoluted? Yeah. Was it quite a lot of animosity, right? Like depending on some of those yeah. factors that that will dictate a lot of how complex that side of my life feels and all the while I'm still expected to go to work every day and do a really hard job that demands a lot of me and then still show up as a parent who cares deeply about my children yeah. while in this kind of tumultuous time yeah yeah like our, our communication was shitty when we were married and then it just got worse as co-parents so we're yeah we're getting better for sure it's it's come a long way but we got lots of lots of work to do, to do still but yeah, yeah, for the most part, we're we're getting better, but it's it's hard because, like you said, you know, to go from working shifts where you're taking care of everybody else to go home and you're still taking care of everybody else. So yeah. it's uh, you never really stop. Totally. Like, where's the downtime? Where does that live? Yeah, sorry, what's that downtime? Right. Does that exist? <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, I, I I will share that. So you and I met inside of the self-care dare process right. that we had run the first time, um, which is where I first heard a little bit about you and your story. Um, and I think part of the drive probably for some amount of that is to engage in like, what does it look like to try to carve out a little bit of space for me yeah, in exactly. this context where there really isn't a lot mm -hmm. of that to find? And it turned out like for one of your sections, you talked about like, it doesn't need to be these grand gestures for yourself, right? It, it could be these yeah. small things. And it was stuff that I was already doing, but that was my biggest yeah. realization for that, for that, um, that session was I'm already doing stuff like yeah. lighting a candle that I like the smell of. I could be playing with my Lego on the floor with my kids and whatever. And I just go, Oh, I should light that candle. That's a good smell. And then I light it, not realizing that I, that I was doing that for myself. So oh, now really? I take the moment to actually like sit in that moment and say, this is me caring for me back yeah. to some Lego. Totally. Right. Well, and it's funny because we talked a lot in that, in that program about this idea of how we would care for others and when we care for others, we don't tend to be like, this is me caring for you, right? Like, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't say that's what we're doing. It's just what's known to be happening as a result of me doing for you or giving to you or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that we often are doing a lot of those things for ourselves. We just don't seem to notice to count them. Right. And that it does involve some amount of like intentionality in order to feel like we actually gain the benefit of it 
instead of it just being this like passive thing that falls in the background. Yeah. And it was surprised me how many times in a day that I actually do something small like that for myself. And I'm more yeah. conscious of it now. Totally. Which well, is- and how those add up. Well, mm-hmm. and I feel like totally like, I think my experience of parenting and parenting with a partner um, and like the degree of exhaustion of balancing work and life and all the things is that when I started parenting was when those small things had to count for so much more because there just isn't the space for some of the big things like the spa day or whatever the thing is. Right. Right. Um, And I would imagine that when you don't have the benefit of a partner that you can be like, Hey, you're on, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. That just you. those small things have to count for just so much more mm-hmm. than they would have otherwise. Yeah. And our family, like my parents live in Saskatchewan and my brothers are in Alberta and BC. So I don't have any family close to even like call up the grandparents and say, right. take my kids. Like, right. They're coming me. for a sleepover. Yeah. I'm running away. Yeah, like, hey, can you just grab? No, no, I'll grab it because there's just me. Yes. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So in that kind of space, what's been the hardest thing for you in navigating the transition from work to home and from, you know, your time where you're giving to others out in the community to the time that you have with your kids? What do you find to be the hardest piece in that? Probably just 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 time, like not enough of it. Um, yeah. Probably trying to find that balance between um, like getting your 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 life at work sorted and then your life at home sorted and then time for yourself. Yeah. Like ma- time management. Like I used to suck at it before and I feel like I still do sometimes, but yeah, to, under- to get that balance, I think has been the hardest for sure. And to find the time for me mm-hmm. because in a day, like when I, let's say I have a day where I take the kids back after my shift work a 10 hour day, boom, kids are home by six o'clock with me and then bedtime. And, and it's like, yeah. you don't stop. You don't have an off button. You have like, you're in a driving mode and you're in sport mode when you're at work. And then you're in eco mode when you get home. Like, and then totally. there's no, just trying to find that balance really is the hardest mm-hmm. I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there things that you've found that help you manage that balance? I think routine is key it's good for the kids but it's good for us um i have a pretty solid bedtime routine with my kids which is my favorite part of the day um just to kind of get us all to wind down so i kind of add um things that i need in my day to their end of their day so we do gratitude journals that's the one thing that i do with my kids every night and i just got them for 4.99 on amazon and it's very basic one page three things that you're thankful for who brought you joy today? And then there's like a strip of faces between super happy and super sad. And they get to circle how uh-huh. they felt most of the day. And the bottom right. is their best part of their day. And they either draw it or we write about it. And it just, it allows me to give time to each kid. Cause I find that yeah. part hard too, is you got two kids, there's just one of you. And it's like, I want to give them indiv- individual attention, but when, so I find yeah. this bedtime is perfect. Cause I start the first half of the journal with one and while the other while that one's drawing I go to the other one and I'm able to give my kids that that time alone with just me which they don't get often or ever yeah and it just kind of winds down lets us reflect over the day and then I'm thinking about the same things that I'm thankful for Mm. so and I find that bedtime just kind of winds me down and winds them down but the routine of that I think it's they look forward to it I look forward to it it's just Cool. That works. Yeah, it kind of creates this like level of predictability. Exactly. Which is lovely, I think, particularly for people who work in first response and frontline work because so much of your day is so unpredictable. Like it's predictably unpredictable. Yeah, exactly. Right? What I can yeah. count on is that I have no idea what's going to happen today. Yeah. Um, and the days that I think are going to be super slow end up being crazy. And the days I'm sure are going to be crazy end up surprising me and being slow, right? Like mm-hmm. it always is predictably unpredictable. And so to have something that feels kind of anchoring um, And I love, I mean, bedtime routines for every human are really important. And Mm -hmm. so that wind down process, feeling like it's really predictable is great for kids. I mean, they Mm -hmm. love a sense of knowing what comes next. Yeah. 
Um, I often look at my kids and go like, okay, so what's the next thing? And they both look at me for a second and go, right, teeth, right? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. we all know where we're headed from here and mm -hmm. it, it feels grounding and it allows permission for connectivity differently when we know what's yeah. coming. Exactly. Yeah, cool. What are some of the unique challenges that you feel that you face as a frontline worker who single parents that others may not fully understand? I think, I think the thing to remember is that, like we touched on a little bit earlier about always being on, like mm -hmm. you go to work, you're taking care of everybody else's issues and everybody else's emergencies and everybody else's crap. And then you go home and, and deal with your tiny humans crap. Like it just doesn't end. So I think it just doesn't end. <laughs> And some, like, you don't, like I said earlier, you don't have anybody to, you know, pass that off to. You don't have anybody to be like, you know what? The bathrooms need to be cleaned. Okay. Well, that's me, you know, yeah. um, groceries need to be done. You know, just all of the regular household chores and all the things you need to do to keep your home a safe and healthy and clean space. Yeah. Plus all the things your kids need, you know, add a global pandemic on that and homeschooling in a language you don't speak. <laughs> and like right? yeah um <laughs> right I was totally built for this <laughs> yeah, you know and it was like okay and even single parenting so what we did um, my ex-wife is a teacher so I said well I can easily switch my shifts into a full night shift so then I could mm -hmm. do night shifts and then I can kind of go through my day and homeschool to the afternoon grab yeah. a quick nap when she picks them up and then go into work for the for the next night so right. we did that for the first half of January, February. And it was like, go to work all night, come home, kids, homeschool in a language I don't speak, kids back, nap, back to work and rinse and repeat. Oh and gosh. that was tough. Like that was a lot, but yeah. it allowed my ex to be able to focus on her own classroom and yeah. just a lot. <laughs> A lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Plus groceries, plus cleaning your house, plus doing laundry, like all those things It just, it doesn't end. And, yeah. you know, you, you kind of, some days it's easier to keep your head above water and other days it's like, okay, kids, here's a tablet. Mommy needs like a solid 20 minutes. Totally. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of been one of the interesting pieces emerging from the pandemic is like every parent who didn't want to parent using the television yeah. <laughs> gave up on that. Oh, like yeah. it's just, oh, it's yeah. just a non option yeah. at some point because it feels like it's the only way to catch a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, at and, least I throw yeah. on French YouTube and I throw on all the French channels and I feel better because I'm like, at least you're learning. It's educational. It's educational. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. We have on, we have a laptop that our kids use um that we got during the pandemic because we didn't have something like I take mine to work with me and I continued working through the pandemic my husband has this desktop computer that is a disaster so we bought this little laptop for the kids to be able to do some of the school stuff and whatever and we have like a whole folder of educational games and the deal is that you have to do 20 minutes of educational before you're allowed to do anything fun right. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like hey, can I play on the laptop? And you're like, yeah, for sure. But, and then they're like, I know, educational. <laughs> and then they will set reminders on our Echo device. Like they'll say, hey, Echo, oh, set yeah. a timer for 20 minutes because they want to be like the like, minute that, that that's yeah. over. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know. I set up my girls' <laughs> tablets that way. I got these Amazon Fire tablets and you can set it up so they ha they like it won't open any fun apps until you do like 10 minutes of yes. reading or and then once they get totally. to that point it says congratulations you did it and then it opens up all the fun stuff and Amazing. you can turn it off so if they're sitting in the corner they're not listening to you you're like come on hello hello you can go on your phone and you can pause it and then they're like mommy cool. something happened i'm like well, i don't know it's you must have played too many games like <laughs> come magic. Over here. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Brilliant. I love it. Best invention. I love it. I mean, we were talking when we first started before I hit record about how I have a love-hate relationship with technology. Those are the things I love. Are yeah. the things where you're like, oh, man, I guess yeah. something just knew that it was time to be done. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, I think you've kind of like hit on this piece around there's just no break. Like, unless you are single parenting in a context where you do have a lot of family nearby or a really good community of support, there is just a lot of, I'm the one holding all of the bags. 
And how do you balance all of that when it seems to just get heavier and heavier? Right. And like, and then we do do add something like a pandemic to the mix. Mm -hmm. Like it's already so hard. And then we throw in these extra life events. And it's the hardness about like the day-to-day stuff, but also like making sure you're emotionally available for your kids and that you're guiding your kids emotionally through all of this other stuff without them being unscathed. Like, you know, throw away the guilt of, you know, putting your kids in a broken home situation and add on top of all the other guilt about all the other things. And it's like, you just yeah. want, at the end of the day, your, your kids just want to be loved. And that's totally. all really they need. They need to know that you love them no matter what. And mommy shows up exhausted after a 14 hour night shift, you know, to teach you and get you in homeschooling for the day. Like they see that they notice that. Yeah. And I know my oldest one for sure does. She's my empathetic little kid. And she like, mommy, you look tired. Yeah. This is how I look now. So just, just get used to it. This is my face. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So this episode kind of emerged as a result of getting some feedback about the episode we did a couple weeks ago on mm-hmm. parenting. Um, and, and there was this piece raised about the fact that not everyone gets to have the help that partners who are sharing the load of parenting get to have Mm -hmm. um, when doing the transition from frontline work to family. And I, I appreciated the kick in the butt that a couple of people gave me in calling that out because we have also identified that first responders and frontline workers face a disproportionate rate of divorce and relationship ending. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And in part, the nature of the work in part, the nature of, how the work changes us, the nature of mental health within the work. Like there's a lot of factors that contribute to some of that. Definitely. And just the way that relationships, like generally relationships, um, divorce rates are really high across the board, but mm-hmm. for sure higher for first responders and frontline workers. And I recognize that not all of the skills that we've talked about in making the transition home um, in some of those episodes around partnering and parenting feel as possible or doable when there isn't another adult in the house to help balance out your needs for time and space. Mm -hmm. You shared about this piece about bedtime routine, feeling like a helpful skill. Are there any other skills you're finding helpful in making that transition from work to home and then potentially also home back to work? Right. Or generally kind of prioritizing your wellness in the midst of it? Yeah. Like I prioritize what I need to get done differently So when I have my kids, I don't get caught up in how messy my house is. I don't get caught up in laundry. I don't get caught up in that kind of stuff because I go to work, let's say a 10 hour day, come home. I can throw a load of laundry on them. You know, my kids Mm -hmm. aren't there. I can get kind of all that stuff done. So, I mean, we tidy up, but my house basically gets destroyed when I have, when I'm with my kids because I don't want to spend time sitting there cleaning and whining and vacuuming when I can be stepping on Lego and just immersing myself in their lives. Right. Because I only have them half the time. So I find that prioritizing stuff that I need to get done, like grocery pickups. I'm sorry. I hate grocery stores. So like when you can order groceries online and go pick them up in your car and not even leave your car, best invention, like a thousand percent do that if you're not doing it already. Because click and collect, if any stores, the pandemic, that's my favorite part of the pandemic so far. It's going online shopping and then just driving up to the store and getting it. Uh Because that also, like even even the process of grocery shopping, unless you really love it, like go in and have your time if you have it. But to get that task done, like, yeah, is the best. So like those kind of tasks to do when I'm my kids aren't around that way when they are, I'm not doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we do lots of fun adventure things that I like to do. So <laughs> this winter yeah. I taught them how to snowboard because I love snowboarding. So I want to get nice. them new stuff. Um, built an ice rink so that they can skate around because I love hockey. So cool. I'm just kind of making them into tiny me's so that they like to do yeah. all the things I like to do. So it's kind of like, hey, let's go camping. I like camping. That's for yeah. me, but it's also for you. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, and it's, I mean, those are the things that help then bond us and create that memory making piece that 
carry with our kids, even if they didn't love the thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like maybe your kids don't love hockey as much as you love hockey, but that memory of the time that mommy did this thing is still pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 Totally. That's cool. I wonder if there's any like resources or supports that you found really valuable through the process of single parenting. Um, I live in a pretty small town, um, a little village and in my village, I found my village. So yeah. I have this one friend, she's like my ride or die. And if I'm having a crappy day and my kids are getting on my nerves, I can call her up and say, I'm coming over, you're cooking us dinner, what can I bring? And she'll just tell me what to bring and we'll show up. She's a stay-at-home mom of three. So our kids are very similar in ages, so they get along really well. And just that one person that gets it. Yeah. Because not a lot of people get it, but you find that one person that gets it and you don't have to explain anything. And I find having that has been my lifesaver, like even pre-pandemic, like even during my nasty divorce. It was just that one person that I can just say, I'm having a day. And she's yeah. like, okay, I got wine. All right, let's go. Come on over. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it happens the other way around too. Like she'll sit, she'll call me. She's like, oh, I want to sell my kids. I'm like, all right, bring them over here. I'll buy them. I got lots of food and we'll feed them and we'll get them together and they won't stop, you know, fighting with each totally. other. So. But finding totally. that village of people that you can rely on and it's, it's, it's key to yeah. have those people that you can just, you don't have to explain to because even explaining it is, you just don't want to. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's cool when we get to have those people that we can rely on. I'm curious how you cultivated that for yourself. Like how did that relationship or relationships like that come about for you? Well, that one in particular, um, I, she was a trainee of mine at ambulance dispatch that didn't make okay. it through. And then yeah. she lived in this small town and she, there was a house for sale and we moved here and became friends that way and then I convinced her to quit her job and be our nanny when we were married so yeah. she was our nanny for a couple of years three years and then just yeah. from there it just blossomed into this ride or die friendship cool mm -hmm. that's really cool I mean I think that's one of the things that I hear from I think a lot of people generally but particularly from those I know who are kind of balancing the single parent Thing with the rest of their work and lives and whatever is that it's hard to make friends with people right. like we have this thing where in you know school when we're kids we make friends because we're all stuck together for really long periods of time and like right. you have to find someone that you don't hate to hang with yeah. when you're stuck there for years and years and years um but after that our context change changes quite significantly and it's harder as we get older to make new friends, in part because the people we're meeting are already in a context where they may already have a community that feels quite strong for them. Right. So it can be harder to feel like we fit into someone else's context. But it's also that like we go to this job, we don't necessarily want to be best friends with all of the people we work with because then it feels like the only thing we have to relate around is the work. Yeah. Um, we also don't necessarily have a lot of time that we're in other kinds of venues to meet people who are outside of work. So then how do we create these connections? And we like all know that it's important. We all hear the value of it, but the actual, how do you find a person to be your friend yeah. is the tricky part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. That's cool. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you have found a person like yeah. that. Oh yeah, she's she's the key to my success in my life, especially during yeah. a pandemic. She was my bubble group, and it was like, I'm not getting sick of seeing you because we only have each other. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, and it's hard because I think it involves some amount of like risk to find yeah. those people and yeah. to venture into some of those friendships. I know I have a friend who we met volunteering for a thing together, and we didn't know each other super well, but I I realized that anytime we were in meetings together. I really liked whatever she had to say. Like, I feel like we were just like mm -hmm. spirit sisters, right? Like every time she would speak, I'm like, yeah, yes. that. Yeah. Um, and then she announced that she was going to leave volunteering for this group. And I was like, 
oh no, this is the only space I see you. And I, I don't want to not see you anymore. And so I sent her this email. Hilariously, my husband read it later on and was like, it kind of sounds like you're asking her out on a date. Um, <laughs> and probably a little bit I was because it was like, I just really like everything about you. And I'm really <laughs> sad you're leaving this thing because I feel like I haven't gotten a chance to like make you my friend yet. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're open to it I'd really like us to go out for lunch and like be friends yeah. <laughs> she it was so great because she wrote back and she was like do you know what I feel that way too Aww. <laughs> oh, great and yeah. so it's actually super funny where um there's quite an age difference between us and hilariously we actually both grew up in Calgary and we went to I would have been in the elementary school that was right next to her junior high school at the same time yeah. And we both live in BC now and whatever. But it was super fascinating to just be like, that felt uncomfortable and risky to yeah. step out. But it also felt more risky to lose the potential of that friendship because you don't feel that way all the time. Like you don't always find that kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, what you say I love. Like it makes yeah. me light up. And as a single parent, like when are you going to get out to meet people at random things? Like right. you're, you're not like just right. you're not. And it's usually like mom groups or like parents um, that are involved in your kids' sports. Like my girls play ringette, my girls play soccer, gymnastics. Like it's those kind of moms at those events that you end up being friends with because same place, same time. And you get along yeah. with some people or like classmates, parents, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's kind of like the being open to some of those spaces. And then I think kind of bringing ourselves into them more because I think we can kind of become like wallflowers in that where... Yeah. We let the kids do the kid thing and all the parents stand awkwardly along the walls and, and don't necessarily interact right. because it feels uncomfortable to jump in and start a conversation with someone that I don't really know. But you're right. Those are the spaces that we're in. And when you are single parenting, that those spaces are so much narrower because time is so much more limited. Mm -hmm. And so using those really intentionally, I would imagine would be like a really significant aspect of how to grow some of that sense of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also hard because relationships take time. Like you can't just like befriend someone and then the next day be like, okay, I'm coming to your house. You need to make me dinner. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. that friendship is like 12 years now so right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> totally. right. <laughs> but it's like when you're in the in the midst of like but I need someone like that right now yeah. like yeah. It, it's hard knowing that I have to invest in that for like a while before I yeah. get to have that come out the other side mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. are there any other tools or suggestions or pieces of encouragement you would offer to others who are working to balance the demands of frontline work with their home lives as single parents yeah, I think I think the thing to remember is like you sit there and you worry about your kids, right? Most of all, you know, let alone being a child of divorce, you know, ah, but like, yeah. like all they want is your time and all they want is to know that that they matter to you. So and it doesn't need to be these big grand. Oh, look, this is what I bought you. They don't they don't care about any of that stuff. So like probably the best advice is to to not not worry about all the other things that are piling up and live more in your moments that you're with your kids and yeah. find that time or you everybody probably already does it because when i was in that self-care group and then you're like oh yeah this is self-care this is self-care i'm like it is i do that <laughs> like <laughs> and to, to have those realizations of the small things like my cozy reading socks i put those on every night like and that's yeah. something you know totally. i throw something in the oven that I like to eat and make my kids eat it. And yes, it's a fight, but it's delicious. So that's for me. Yeah. And totally. to, to get rid of the guilt, the parent guilt, I mean, it's awful and it's rampant, you know, like I should be doing more. I wish I was doing more. And sometimes all you can do is sit on the couch beside your kids and just listen to them breathe. And that's okay. Totally yeah. fine. Don't put pressure on yourself because it's chaos. Like life as a single parent and a first responder is, is a lot. And just give yourself yeah. grace because totally. like, just pause and be like, you're killing it and then move on. And if you have a crappy day, I talk to my kids all the time about my crappy days. They've seen me cry more often yeah. than I've ever cried in my whole life. Yeah. And to just say, you know what? Mommy has bad days. You have bad days. This is a, this is not a great day for mommy today, but we're just going to mm -hmm. sit here and hang out. And totally. You know, being vulnerable in front of your kids is important. I, I love that. that. 
and talk about why you're sad and you know age appropriately like mommy's just had a really hard day so i just want to sit here and watch you play on your tablet or whatever yeah for sure yeah well and i think one of the things i love about that and that i feel very strongly about in my own parenting with my kids is that i want them to grow up believing that grown-ups aren't perfect yeah and so when I have my not perfect moments. It's like this permission granting piece for them to recognize that none of us have it all figured out or all together all the time Mm -hmm. and that it's okay. And that we can care about each other in the midst of it um, and have grace for ourselves and offer ourselves that, that ability to like have a bad day. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, And I hope that they keep that as they age and as they go into their own adult life to know Mm -hmm. that, that's what's normal because I think that that's not what we all had characterized as normal for us growing up yeah right and so to be able to like shift the expectations and pressures we put on our kids to feel like they have to be like perfect or all together um I think gives them space to breathe too exactly yeah yeah Mm -hmm. that's cool solid advice (laughs) good one Thanks. Um, I also feel like, I mean, in the midst of it, you're parenting kids that are still really young. Um, and it goes so fast, right? Mm-hmm. Like some of the pressures that are right now won't be the pressures forever. Mm-hmm. And I love that piece of like, just enjoy them, yeah. just anchor into enjoying them, even mm-hmm. when it feels like chaos, yeah. because it will shift drastically in coming years where their interest in being on the couch breathing with you is probably going to look very different. Yeah. Right. And so allowing this time to count for something, even though it's hard and uncomfortable. Yeah. Because it's valuable. And it's, it's getting yourself in that moment where, you know, you got a messy kitchen, you got food all over the floor, you got laundry coming out of your yin yang. Yeah. And you look at your kids and I look at my oldest one and I go, I only have 10 years at home with her left. That's it. Totally. I already yeah. had eight. I don't know where the heck those eight went. Only 10 years and then she's gone. Yeah. And I find I ground myself a lot in those moments. Like my, my kindergartner is going to first grade next year. Yeah. I am not okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, where did that, How did did that happen? happen? You know, like we're having body training and I'm like, whatever i'm not gonna yeah. she's not gonna pee her pants in college like yes you know it's just yes. those moments of like this isn't gonna last this stage isn't gonna last forever and yeah. i was kind of that way since they were infants i was like okay one day she's not gonna scream at me for very long <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she'll still scream at me but just like yes i only have like I only have my oldest daughter for 10 more years and I'm, I'm not okay with that. So yeah, grounding myself in that moment of she wants to cuddle me. Yes. Always. Yeah. Yes. Mommy. Like I could be in the middle of something. Mommy, can you cuddle? My kids know I'll always say yes. Yeah. Cause there's going to be a day where they're not going to want to do that. Uh-huh. So I got to live it up now. Right. Mm-hmm. I've made my eldest swear to me that he'll continue to cuddle me when he's 30. Oh. Um, like I've, I I've like, we've been like snuggling and I'm like, you know, I worry about the day where you're not going to want to cuddle with mommy anymore. And he's like, I will always cuddle with you, mommy. And I'm like, I would like that in writing. Yeah. I have, I would, like, I would like a signature. Yeah. Mine's in video on the cloud. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. but see, you right. promised. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Good one. Okay. We're going to wrap up because we have to wrap up, but I so appreciate your time today. And I so appreciate some of the, the like insights that you've been able to, to share around a, what it's like to be in it and b some of the unique challenges of that. And then see some of the creative ways that you've had to come at figuring out how to do the balancing act, which I feel like is probably like an ever evolving process. Like you kind of just strike the balance and then Mm -hmm. it tips a little bit again. Um, And I think like one of the things we talked about in the self-care dare was this idea of like constantly reevaluating where I'm at and checking in with myself because it will be this like, Oh, I thought I had it and I did. 
but then a pandemic happened and it tips everything <laughs> a little bit or a lot or like, and I have to re-strategize and get creative in different ways about it. And then it'll be like, now we're reopening and it tips a different direction and it means yeah. a whole new set of skills or um, answers to different challenges. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. a lot too, like, I guess another piece of advice is use your strength. And I mean, that's a, that's a mantra I've got in my head this whole time is that tipping the balance and adapting, like that's, that's yeah. our career is to adapt yes. and change. So being able to do that in your home life, it's not a skill you need to learn. You already know how to do it. The strength yeah. is already there. You just got to tap into it. And once you get to the other side of it and you have that balance figured out and you got to tip and reevaluate and readapt, it's, yeah. It definitely gets easier and easier because that's what, what that's what you do. That's who you are. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. mm, good one. Because you're right. That's like a universal characteristic yeah. of those of you who are out there doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for your time, Mariah. It's been lovely getting to chat with yeah. you. And it's been really fun to actually like get to see and interact with you a little bit yeah. more outside of just like the Facebook group and right? all of the yeah. things that we did then. Yeah. Thanks for having cool. me. It's been a pleasure. As we end this episode and go into summer holidays, I want to thank you for listening. And thanks again to Mariah for joining us today. I also want to offer an invitation to connect with me and let me know what you would like to hear more about. During the summer months, I'll be planning and preparing new episodes for the fall and hope to hit on topics like mental health and suicidality within first response and frontline work how to know when therapy might be helpful and ways to find a therapist who fits your needs. I know that that's impossible. Pieces around meeting basic needs like sleep when navigating shift work and more tools for grounding and regulating emotions and mood. All that said, what I want more than anything is for this podcast to feel like a resource that meets your needs. And you can help me by letting me know what you really need to hear more about reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram at Lindsay A. Foss or email me at support at thrive-life.ca. You heard Mariah and I talk about the self-care dare today. We just closed registration for the dare yesterday and it kicks off today, but we plan to do it again in the fall. So if you're interested, jump over to the podcast webpage right now by Googling Behind the Line Lindsay and sign up for the wait list so we can notify you when we run it next. Thank you for a wonderful time. Thank you for inviting me into whatever you're listening on. And I'm wishing each and every one of you a wonderful summer season. Until next time, stay safe.